Good afternoon, everybody. So this week, kids across the country are heading back to school for the new school year. Today is supposed to be an exciting day for students and parents, but instead, we're seeing yet another horrific shooting. Now, as a parent myself, I know the anxiety that comes with sending your kid out into the world every day, living with the real fear of the worst, the worst can happen. So please know that our hearts are with those families in Winder, Georgia, who are forced to face this act of senseless violence. I want to let you know that the president and the vice president have both been briefed and his administration will continue coordinating with federal, state, and local officials as we receive more information. We're grateful for the brave first responders who are on the scene and we stand by, we stand ready to provide support as needed. As the president has said time and time again, this is not normal. This is not normal. Students and teachers deserve to know that their schools are safe. They should focus on learning, not lockdowns. While the president and vice president have taken historic action to reduce gun violence, more must be done to keep our schools and communities safe. We continue to call on Congress to do something, to do something. We need universal background checks. We need ban to ban assault weapons and high capacity magazines, require safe storage of firearms, invest in violence prevention programs, and pass a national red flag law. Enough is enough. And I cannot say this enough, which is enough is enough. We cannot allow this to happen in our communities. We cannot allow this to happen in our schools. So we have to do everything that we can to keep our children safe, to keep the people who are supposed to protect our children, where our children who, who are they supposed to learn from safe, and enough is enough. Congress needs to act. Now turning to my colleague uh, from NSC who's here to discuss uh, the latest Biden-Harris administration actions today against foreign actors attempting to covertly influence our elections and undermine confidence in our democratic institution. Admiral John Kirby will discuss the coordinated actions we are taking in addition to other foreign policy news of the day. Admiral. Good afternoon, everybody. I think as you saw today, the Department of Justice, Department of Treasury, and the State Department took a series of coordinated actions against foreign actors associated with the Russian government who are attempting to covertly influence our elections. Specifically, all these federal agencies revealed activities directed and funded by RT, formerly known as Russia Today, to covertly spread Russian government propaganda with the aim of reducing international support for Ukraine, bolstering pro-Russian policies and interests, and influencing voters here in the U.S. Uh, and in foreign elections as well. RT is no longer just a propaganda arm of the Kremlin. It is being used to advance covert Russian influence actions. Additionally, the Russian government is laundering influence and information operations through Kremlin-controlled commercial firms, such as the Social Design Agency, that work extensively at the direction and control of the Russian Federation. All of this activity was designed to funnel disinformation through outlets and social media influencers that a certain number of Americans find credible. We will not stand for that. So in addition to the law enforcement actions that were announced just a little bit ago by the Attorney General, the State Department announced a new policy to restrict visas for employees of Kremlin-supported media organizations that are affiliated with these covert activities. And they released a $10 million reward for justice for individuals associated with a Russian hacking group that's named Russian Angry Hackers Did It, or Ra Did, for short, as it's also known. The State Department also designated six RT-affiliated entities as foreign missions, a designation that now requires them to report information about their personnel and their property to the United States government. 
For their part, the Treasury Department is sanctioning six executives and officials affiliated with RT, three executives associated with other Kremlin-controlled organizations. And additionally, the Treasury Department is designating ANO Dialogue, a Russian government-funded, I'm sorry, a Russian government-founded nonprofit that uses artificial intelligence to create and distribute online Russian disinformation for use against election campaigns. The Treasury included ANO Dialogue's subsidiary and its executive officer in its sanctions as well. Now, Russia, of course, is not alone in its desire to destabilize our democracy. As you may recall, just last month, the United States government disclosed that Iran engaged in a series of cyber actions with the intent to gain access to the private communications of former President Trump and his campaign by way of associated political advisors. Those efforts were clearly intended to denigrate former President Trump and to compromise his political campaign. We made it clear then, and we make it clear again today, that this is unacceptable and we won't stand for it either. Let me close with just two more thoughts, if I could. First and most importantly, we are committed to protecting our democracy and our elections, regardless of the source or the target trying to interfere with them. As today's actions make clear, we have the ability to monitor these threats, to thwart them, to identify the actors involved, and to hold the actors involved accountable. We will continue to do so. These actions are the result of months of hard investigative and interagency cooperation, and we're grateful for the law enforcement, diplomatic, intelligence, and treasury professionals who brought it all together. They put the interest of the American people first, where, right where it belongs. That brings me to my second point. The hard work now must continue. No resting, no waiting, no backing off. The American people can rest assured that the men and women of the federal government are at this very moment laboring to prevent future abuses and interference in our electoral process. But this cannot alone be the work of government. Every citizen bears a hand. We urge all Americans to read through the indictment today. Study the sanctions and the designations that we announced. All of it's online. All of it is readily available to you. Likewise, please take time to consider how you get your news and information. It can be difficult, of course, to be absolutely certain of its authenticity, especially given the covert tactics of groups like RT. But with time, some patience, and a firm reliance on credible and established media outlets, that uncertainty can be greatly reduced. As President Biden has said, democracy can at times be fragile, but it is also inherently resilient. We all need to work together as Americans to ensure that resilience. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, first on the, this disinformation campaign, can you talk a little bit more about why unveiling this now? And secondly, is this just, do you see this as just the tip of the sword? Is there more out there? Um, and the why now question is basically, I think, in some ways, people, a lot of Americans would say about Russian disinformation, not surprising. Um, and may, in some ways, question why is the administration doing this so close to the election? And I may be answering my own question a little bit here, uh, but if you could just talk to the timing. And then secondly, has there been any more meetings with senior officials and Israelis today uh, regarding the ceasefire or the situation on uh, the Israel-Lebanon border? Uh, okay, there's a lot there. Um, on the why now, and I think the Attorney General talked about this. I mean, the actions that they announced today, and of course it was coordinated with the announcements by State and Treasury, all really reflected where they were in the investigative process. And as the Attorney General said, Amr, it's still an ongoing investigation, so uh, I wouldn't rule out anything in terms of any future actions that might be taken. Depends on where this investigation takes us. So the, the why now was really driven by the progress of the investigation, the certainty they had in what they had uncovered, and the ability that they believe they had to take the actions um, in, in a way that uh, were commensurate with the goals of the investigation. So it was all really time to the investigation, that's all. Um, and you asked for tip of the spear. Um, but let me go back to, you also said people are maybe shrugging about this because, well, it's just, you know, but that's, I mean, I, I, obviously people can have their own views about whether they're surprised or not that Russia might be trying to interfere in our election, but we're not taking it lightly. Um, nobody's shrugging here uh, because it's that important. It's that important to convey to the American people that we are taking the safety and security of our electoral process seriously. So uh, nobody's shrugging about it, and we're, we're going to constantly... Um, Monitor, as I said, these threats, be able to thwart them when we see them and identify and hold the, uh, the actors accountable. On your, on your second question about um, the ceasefire talks, I have no additional specific meetings to talk about today, except that even today, 
we are in touch with our counterparts in Qatar, in Israel, and certainly uh, in Egypt uh, about trying to see if we can get a proposal that can be finally culminated and a ceasefire deal can be achieved. So those conversations are active even today. There was a report that Jake uh, Amstockstein and Brett McGurk had, um, uh, had a virtual meeting today uh, with Dermer and I think some other Israeli officials. Is that not true? I, I won't confirm any specific individual sessions except to tell you that even today there have been ongoing conversations with our counterparts, as you would expect that it would be. So even though there's not teams meeting in Doha or Cairo right now, it's not like the, uh, the effort has lapsed. Um, thanks, Green. Thanks, Admiral. Um, on the, um, the Russian interference, is there any, su uh, any indication of at what level this has been apparently approved in Russia? Does this go, I mean, does this go up to Putin's level, for example? And secondly, is there any sign of the, um, this uh, disinformation favoring one or other of the candidates in the, uh, in the U.S. election? We believe Mr. Putin is winning of these actions. Um, as for your second question, I think, uh, look, in, in, in Iran's case, it was very clear. As I mentioned in my opening statement, and I think the Attorney General did too, very clear that they were trying to denigrate President, former President Trump uh, and in, involve themselves in his campaign uh, to, their de to their detriment. Um, I would say, though, uh, what we talked about on, in Russia, they are certainly uh, trying to sow discord, feed disinformation. Um, and try to put narratives out there through voices that the American people might find credible that support their policies, that support their interests, such as uh, trying to diminish support uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, so it's very consistent with what, we, what we've seen Mr. Putin do in the past. Thanks, Karine. Thanks, Admiral. So as you alluded to, we've been here before, and after 2020, the administration imposed sweeping sanctions and also took efforts to prevent this sort of behavior. So why are we here again? And what about today's actions will deter future uh, disinformation? We're here again because actors like Iran and Russia uh, are at it again uh, and continue to believe that uh, it somehow suits their interest to interfere in our electoral process. So we're, we're here because, because of what they've been doing and that we're trying to hold them accountable and to make it harder for them to do this. And that's exactly what the actions today, and I'm sure actions to come as appropriate will do, will make it harder for them. Will it make it completely impossible? Probably not, because they'll find workarounds. I mean, these are actors, in this case, driven by the Kremlin itself, that are bound and determined uh, to try to change and influence the way Americans vote when they go in that ballot box. And that's why I said it at the end of my opening statement, everybody, not just the federal government, but everybody needs to be concerned about this. And everybody needs to bear a hand in pushing back on the influence attempts by Russia. And then on Israel, um, we asked Karine, not me, I wasn't here yesterday, but my <laughs> colleagues asked Karine uh, in many different ways about the president's recent comments with regard to Netanyahu not doing enough to secure a ceasefire deal. So my question is whether he has directly expressed that himself to Netanyahu, that he is not doing enough. I would say that the conversations with the Prime Minister every time uh, they occur are very direct and very forthright. Uh, these, are, these are two guys that know each other well. And uh, the President, um, he makes his concerns uh, very plainly known. But for all the things that those two gents may not agree on politically, and maybe not even completely agree on in the conduct of the war, they do agree on the central tenet that Israel needs to be defended that the Israeli people shouldn't have to live next door to that kind of a threat, and that the United States, and President Biden specifically, is going to continue to stand with Israel as they defend themselves against this threat, um, and to do everything that we can uh, to try to bring this conflict to a close. And then one quick one, just for clarification, because a lot is, continues to happen on this front. When the president is calling for a ceasefire, does he mean a permanent ceasefire at this point, or does he mean one long enough to allow the hostages to be released? Well, it's a little bit of both. I mean, the, the, the ceasefire that we're really trying to drive out right now is getting to phase one, which gets you six weeks of no fighting. Six weeks of no fighting, and that means more humanitarian assistance and then getting a, at least the first tranche of hostages out, the ones that are at the most risk, elderly, sick, uh, women in particular. But 
if you can get through phase one, because once you get into phase one, and that's the goal, just let us get to phase one right now, then you can start building towards phase two. And if you can get to phase two, you can get both sides to phase two, well, then you're talking about a, a real potential end to the hostilities in general, which of course will be a general ceasefire. So what we're focused on right now is phase one. That's a six week ceasefire. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate it. Taking a step back, just to follow up there, has the message from this administration been to families of Americans held hostage still that the only hope for their loved ones is getting to phase one of that ceasefire deal? Our message to the families, and we conveyed this recently, uh, Mr. Sullivan did, is that we're going to keep doing everything we can to get their loved ones home where they belong. Everything we can. Right now, we continue to believe that the best option, the best possible way to do that is through this deal that's been on the table now for how many months? Um, and as I've said before, I'll say so again today, we still believe these gaps can be narrowed. We still believe it's an achievable outcome. Whether we'll get there or not, I don't know. But we still believe that, uh, uh, that we're close enough that we've got to, we got to keep our shoulders to the wheel. But I guess my question is, it might be the best option, but is it the only option? I think it would be imprudent for me to either negotiate the details of this deal in public or to speculate about any other kinds of opportunities might occur if it falls apart. I just don't think it would be useful for me to do that. What I can assure you, and we have assured the families, is that President Biden and this entire national security team is 100% dedicated to getting their loved ones home. Right now, the, the locus of that energy, the full focus of this administration, is trying to get this ceasefire deal in place. Uh, switching gears to Ukraine, obviously a big shakeup in the government there. Is that the kind of thing that the U.S. is giving advice on or weighing in when you hear, when you, you know, obviously you're in close contact with everyone in Zelensky's government, are they seeking your advice on how to make changes to their government? No, and we're not offering advice on how to administer uh, their democracy. That's up to President Zelensky. It's up to the Ukrainian people. These decisions are President Zelensky's decisions to make with respect to who's supporting him in his cabinet. It's not going to change the way we interact with Ukraine. It's certainly not going to change the support that we're going to continue to provide them. Great, Great. Um, John, on a different topic, has the president spoken to his counterpart in Japan about plans to block the merger of the U.S. Steel deal? And are you concerned that it will impact relations between the two countries? No, there's no conversations to speak to, Jeff. The um, president has been uh, very consistent on this. He believes that American steel companies ought to be American-owned. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a CFIUS process that, that, uh, that uh, needs to occur. This is the kind of uh, potential transaction that we believe is suitable for a CFIUS review, and I really can't go beyond that. You, uh, just on a different topic then, um, back to Israel, do you have a timeline for when this latest proposal, peace proposal, is going to be made? Ultimately, we'd like to have it now. Um, there's a real sense of urgency here to try to get this done. Um, and as I said earlier to Amr, I mean, even today, we've been having very active conversations with our counterparts in the region to try to get it across the finish line. We want, it, we want to get it done now. There, it needs to be, it needs to be closed. Thanks, uh, John, you're obviously willing to acknowledge that Iran's intent uh, in uh, attempting to interfere in the election is to as you put it, denigrate a uh, former president, you don't seem willing to acknowledge that Russia's intent is to denigrate the vice president. Why is that? I'm just telling you what we've learned through the investigation and what we've seen. Uh, I'm reiterating what the attorney general laid, laid, uh, laid out uh, this afternoon in terms of what RT has become and what this social design agency was trying to do in cyberspace in terms of sowing disinformation and discord. Um, it's not for some sort of uh, queasiness about talking about their intentions. I just, I'm just laying out what we've seen and what the law enforcement actions were taken today and why they were taken today. Um, uh, but obviously, when you know, when we have something declarative that we can speak to, we'll, we'll, we'll speak to that. Okay. And then just on another matter, there's a report that um, a U.S. service member was detained in Venezuela. Do you have a comment on that? I can confirm that a U.S. service member uh, was, in fact, uh, detained in Venezuela. My understanding is that this individual was on some sort of personal travel and not official government business. Um, I think the Pentagon has spoken to this or plans to provide a little bit more context on it. I really can't go beyond that. We're obviously, just the last thing I'd say is we're obviously in touch 
uh, as appropriate as we as you think we would be with Venezuelan authorities to try to get more uh, knowledge and information about this. Does the president feel particular pressure about typically when Americans are detained somewhere overseas, he can sort of act unilaterally with partners and so forth, but can do that. This has been much more complex because of uh, Israel's uh, desire to, to lead anything. It, does he have a separate track for unilateral actions that he could take, and does he have a timeline for that? Nothing's more important to the president than safety and security of Americans overseas, particularly those that are being held hostage or detained. And, and of course, uh, the, the president wants to take the widest view possible of options available him, to him to secure the release of people that are held hostage or detained. Um, and you've seen that we have not been loath to get creative in trying to figure out ways to do that. Um, uh, of course, we think through many different options and alternatives. It would be irresponsible if we didn't, Kelly. But, as I said earlier, we still believe, and, and part of that is because we know we have gotten this done before with a previous ho hostage swap. We still believe that this is the best way uh, to, to move forward. But we'll see where it goes, and obviously I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not in a position, nor would I ever, try to close down decision space for the president in terms of uh, options that might be available to him. Oh, thanks so much. Um, just to put a finer point on Jeff's question from earlier on about um, the steel deal, can you say there has been reporting out there saying the president is prepared to nix that deal? Can you confirm that reporting? I cannot. And um, one other sort of just a, a, a quick question about, I didn't quite hear what you said about um, Putin's personal involvement. He was waiting at this. He was He was waiting of Larty's activities. Okay. Uh, Jen, do you see a possible link between Russian attempts to um, undermine the support for Ukraine as a part of this operation and a six months delay in approving supplemental in Congress that we had earlier this year? And if we can stay on Ukraine today, Russia hit Lviv with uh, ballistic missiles. It's a western city. Uh, seven people were killed, uh, also a seven year old old girl. Yesterday was Poltava. It's a central eastern Ukrainian uh, city. How does it make sense that Russia keeps on killing Ukrainians while Ukraine, and killing Ukrainians even far away from the front lines, when, while Ukraine can, is not allowed to use provided weapons to hit military targets inside Russia, where these attacks are coming from? Yeah, I, uh, on your first question, uh, I cannot point to connective tissue between RT's covert influence activities and the, 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 the delay of the supplemental. You, you know, you should talk to members of Congress, uh, the Republican side in particular, who held that up. Uh, and they can talk to their reasons for why they did that. And for that six months, you want to talk about what's going on in Ukraine today? For that six months, Russia made gains. Russia gained, gained ground. They took territory. They killed more Ukrainians. And they really put the Ukrainian forces up against it because they didn't have the weapons to fight back. Uh, that, was a, that was a tough six months. Uh, and it did set back the, the campaign in Ukraine. As for what's going on now, um, it, we, we condemned it yesterday and we condemn it today, what Mr. Putin's doing. Uh, hitting civilian infrastructure, trying, especially in advance of winter coming, knocking out energy grids. Um, it's despicable. Unfortunately, it's a play right out of his playbook. It's not something new he hadn't, he hadn't, that he hadn't done before. Nothing's changed about our view that Ukraine should be able to use the tools it has available to it to defend itself. And that's why air defense continues to be a prominent issue in these security packages that we're giving, so that they can help defend against these attacks on, on their energy infrastructure. Ukraine but I no, let me inside get, Russia where these yeah, attacks I was, are I was getting from. There. I was getting all warmed up. I was getting there. I'm telling you, <laughs> nothing's changed about our policy with respect uh, to uh, uh, long-range strikes inside Russia and for Russian territory. Um, I, I also think it's important to note, if I might, that 90% of the aircraft that, that Russia uses for glide bombs and long-range strikes well, we've done the math on this. 90% of them lie outside 300 kilometers from the Ukrainian border, deep inside Russia. So the argument that somehow if you just give them an attack them 
uh, and tell them it's okay, that they're going to be able to go in and, and hit the majority of the Russian aircraft and air bases that are in fact used to strike them is not true. It's a misconception. So we don't foresee the change in policy ever? <clears throat> I don't have any policy changes to speak to today. Thank you. First on elections, you know this is an election year. Elections are being held across the world in dozens of countries. During your investigations, did you come across that Russia and Iran, the two countries that you named, are try to interfere in the elections for other countries as well? We believe that uh, they are using these same tools, particularly through RT and covert influence, to affect foreign elections, yes. In early this year, in May, one of the senior Russian officials had said that uh, U.S. is trying to interfere elections in India. Are you aware about that? What is the response to it? It's not true. It's a ridiculous claim. Next question about uh, President's talk, telephonic call with the Indian Prime Minister Modi after his trip to uh, Russia and Ukraine. Do you think India can play a role in bringing peace and ending the war in Ukraine? And in what way it can do it? Well, we certainly hope so. I mean, I've talked about this before. Any nation that, uh, that is willing to try to help end this war uh, and do so in keeping with President Zelensky's prerogatives, the Ukrainian people's prerogatives, his plan for a just peace, we would certainly welcome a role like that. And was there any talk I thought you said you only had one more. <laughs> <laughs> just follow up with that. Did the two leaders also discuss the situation in Bangladesh? Yes. And what was that? Well, I think they shared the concerns. I mean, the President made, made clear his, his, uh, uh, his uh, continued concerns um, uh, about um, safety and security of the people in Bangladesh and the future of their uh, democratic institutions. Thanks, Greg, and thanks, John. Um, getting back to the Middle East, um, the President on February the 26th said, my hope is by next Monday we will have a ceasefire. Uh, on Saturday evening, just past, he said we are on the verge of having an agreement. And it was on Monday morning when he was asked whether Prime Minister Netanyahu was doing enough to reach a deal, he replied no. Why did it take him more than six months to reach that conclusion? Conclusion? What conclusion? That Prime Minister Netanyahu isn't doing enough to get a ceasefire. The President wants uh, this ceasefire. Uh, the President knows that in order to get this ceasefire, it requires leadership. It requires compromise. Uh, and it requires uh, a common understanding of exactly how this ceasefire is going to benefit the people of Israel and the people of Gaza. And there are substantial things in here for the people of, of Gaza. But if you're asking me to apologize or issue some sort of regret because we, we want to get caught trying, because we want, to, we want to see it over the finish line, because there are times when we've been optimistic that we can get there, only to learn that we couldn't, I ain't gonna do it. There is, no, there is nothing wrong with continuing to try to achieve this incredibly difficult uh, uh, negotiation and, uh, and this outcome, a ceasefire that, again, would, would visit uh, terrific benefits uh, all around, including in the region. Um, and so have there been times when we've been stymied? Yes. Have there been times when we thought we were close and turned out that we weren't as close as we thought? Absolutely. And you know what? Today might be one of those days. Even, to, even today, I told the gaps are, we, we can narrow them. And today might be one of those days that maybe I'll prove to be wrong. But no apologies for, for trying. No apologies for keeping the shoulder to the wheel. But the issue isn't apologies for trying. <laughs> the issue is, does the administration have a realistic view of Prime Minister Netanyahu's willingness to make peace? I think we know Prime Minister Netanyahu pretty well. Nobody better than Joe Biden. I'm sincere with that question. Thanks. Um, earlier this month, um, Vietnam's president traveled to China and met with their president. Um, we're hearing that um, Vietnam's president um, could meet with Biden on the sidelines of the um, United Nations General Assembly later this month. Can you confirm this meeting or just comment on the significance of um, such a meeting given the state of... Um, Which meeting? Uh, the, the, you, me the, the meeting between President Xi and the president of Vietnam or... A potential one between President Biden. A potential Biden. one between the U.S. And, and Vietnam. I don't have a schedule for uh, the U.N. General Assembly to speak to today. As you know, when the President goes uh, up to New York for the, for the General Assembly, not only does he deliver remarks, but he does conduct a series of bilateral discussions. We'll have a much more uh, robust agenda to speak to as we get a little closer to that. But look, uh, on Vietnam, I mean, as you saw, the President upgraded our relationship 
with Vietnam to a full strategic partnership. That's a big deal. And we know that uh, Vietnam uh, values the relationship with the United States, but they're also a neighbor of China. They, li they live in the neighborhood, and of course every nation, every nation's leader there has to determine for themselves what that bilateral relationship with China is going to look like. We respect that. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, first, thank you. Uh, first, on, on Russia, um, this is the type of activity that's been going on for the better part of a decade. And this uh, you mean usage, the election interference? Yeah, and the usage of particularly social media profiles to report false accounts and false narratives. And I'm wondering what role you think the companies and the platforms play in allowing these accounts to proliferate? Uh, these are private companies, and certainly they have to make, uh, they have to make uh, their own decisions. It's not about, you know, we, we obviously are respectful of freedom of speech, and certainly the respectful of the private decisions that these, company, uh, these companies' leaders have to make. But I, we do think it's important. And today's actions and the way the Attorney General laid it out is important to, to expose it, to disclose it. And it's why, in my opening statement, I also urge the American people to be mindful of what's out there. Uh, because, you, you, you know, th these, are, these fake social media personas and disinformation uh, in cyberspace is incredibly difficult to shut down. Uh, so, yes, I, we believe tech companies need to be aware of the, these uh, activities. We believe, and they have taken action in the past to shut down accounts that have violated their own policies and procedures. We encourage that as well. But it also is that the consumers, too, the reader, the viewer, uh, they have responsibilities as well to make sure that they're getting the best possible, most accurate information. And you're not always going to get it uh, just in an online format. And on the Middle East, the Justice Department also unsealed charges against uh, Hamas leaders for the actions of October 7th. The charges were dated back in February, but one of the Hamas leaders that was named is currently located in Doha. And I'm wondering if the U.S. is pressing Qatar to have that leader extradited or arrested. I don't have any law enforcement activity to speak to about that today. Is there any impact that you think unsealing these charges from February will have on the negotiations where they stand right now? Why, why unseal them today? Well, again, I'd refer you to the Justice Department for the decision to why unseal them, as you rightly said, that the, the indictments actually date way back. So that I let the Justice Department speak to the decision about un unsealing it. As for an effect on the discussions, uh, it was important to do, to, to unseal those. It was important to make, make that known, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, we were holding these Hamas leaders accountable. At the same time, we continue, as I said to Amr, having active discussions about the ceasefire deal. We still believe we can get there. What about Al, Al Jazeera in the back? Go ahead, Thank yes. you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm very Sorry, I'm I'm sorry man. I appreciate it. What, what pressure is the United States putting on Hamas and Netanyahu to close this deal? What, I'm sorry, say it again. What pres pressure yeah. we're putting what pre on? What pressure is the United States putting on Hamas and Netanyahu to close this deal? It's not about, it's not, you know, it's not just about uh, twisting arms and putting pressure. It is about having active, what we hope to be constructive conversations about negotiating the final details. And that's really where we are in any negotiation. When you get down to the brass tacks, that's when the horse trading really begins, and that's where it gets difficult, and that's where we are right now. Uh, it's really about trying to get both sides to yes here. And uh, again, I can't negotiate the details in, in, in public with you. But, you know, I, I, um, I heard uh, a question asked yesterday in here about, you know, why we're only pressuring one side uh, and not the other. And I tell you what, you know, it was a, a question about, you know, how uh, only the prime minister is, is feeling the heat. Um, and I'll tell you, if you're Mr. Sinwar, he's buried in a tunnel somewhere. He ain't coming up for air too much. Um, his uh, forces have been decimated. His resources have dried up. Uh, uh, the people he claimed to be protecting and defending are, are living in deplorable conditions because of the war that he started on the, on the 7th of October. Um, so I don't buy this notion that there's no pressure being put on Hamas or Hamas leadership. And the indictments that were unsealed yesterday, I think, prove that as well. So, thank you so much, Eric. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, I do have. Sorry, guys. Be have your patience for a second. All right, I do have one more thing. 
um, before we get going here. Uh, so lastly, today is a day of mixed emotions uh, for us in the press office as we say goodbye to Christine Thompson, who's off to the Cap Capitol Hill. The amount of times I said hello and goodbye to people, it's, uh, but this one is very much uh, one of those that goes in, in the... Uh, in the, in the box of we, are, we very much do have mixed emotions. In a true diva fashion, she's leaving on Beyonce's birthday. <laughs> because if anyone makes an exit with flair, that is Christine, a proud member of the Beehive. Christine was, was, has worn uh, several different hats in the White House, not just here in the White House press office with us. Uh, she joined the White House as a summer intern. Uh, so if you are, have ever been an intern here or want to be an intern here, there are many opportunities. Uh, so went on to serve the First Lady's office, uh, comms office, and then moved over to the press team as one of our Wranglers, as you all know. Uh, she's uh, from Alabama, uh, and she is Alabama all the way down with Southern charm, Peter. I'm sure you'd appreciate that. Quick wit and a hint of shade. Uh, we'll miss her dearly, but we know she'll keep moving on up. Uh, and here's to watching her shine on the hill. We are so proud of you and excited for you. And uh, if you uh, have a moment later today, please come to the back on uh, Lower Press and say, uh, say, give your goodbyes and well wishes to Christine. All right. And with that, we end the briefing. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, I do want to say, as I was walking out, uh, we did hit send on a statement uh, from the president on the shooting in, in Georgia. So hopefully you all have that in your inbox, uh, the awful high school shooting. Uh, we, are we will continue to work with uh, local officials, and we, are, we stand ready uh, to work with uh, law enforcement on the ground. It is a, a horrific, horrific day, a sad day uh, when kids go to school and have to deal with uh, that type of violence. And that is something that is, uh, in, in the President's statement, he talks about how it's personal to him. Obviously, um, he and the First Lady, uh, certainly Dr. Biden, are mourning the deaths, uh, uh, mourning the deaths of those uh, whose lives were cut too short. These are high school kids, high school kids. And so uh, we certainly will be thinking of them, but we want to continue to do the work uh, on gun violence, uh, obviously not just in Georgia, but across the country. And the president, this is a president, uh, an administration, the Biden-Harris administration, who has uh, put that at the forefront and want to continue to see that, that done. And as I said at the end of the, my topper earlier, is that enough is enough, and, and, uh, and congressional members need to act. They need to act. Get Homer. First, thanks for the reminder about Beyonce's birthday. Oh, we'll have to say that. You know, that's what we're here for, clearly. <laughs> um, but on a more serious note, yeah. you've said, and you just said it again, about yeah. the need to do work. The president has limited time in office. Um, does he think, or, or is he planning to take another shot at gun control uh, with what time he has left? And, and I'm glad you said you you, uh, you said another shot because we were able, this president, uh, and as you talk about, uh, you know, the final. Uh, couple of months of his administration, uh, let's not forget the three and a half years and what the president was able to do is pass a bipartisan uh, piece of legislation to deal with uh, gun violence and something that we hadn't seen in decades, in 30 years. And this president, this vice president, was able to make that work and make that uh, uh, come to fruition. Obviously, we need more. We need more work to be done. We, it cannot stop at that bipartisan uh, legislation. Uh, we have to continue. We got to continue to find ways and to, and their actions, their actions. I talked about them banning assault weapons, high capacity magazines, uh, making sure uh, that uh, we have uh, universal background checks. These are easy things to do. Uh, I believe, we believe congressional Democrats are ready to move. We have to have, we can't do it by ourselves. Congress can't do it by themselves. They need Republicans to step in and also do this like they did before, like they did before, not too long ago. Uh, to get this done. So this is personal to the president, as he says in his statement. Uh, this is personal to the vice president. This is personal to the, uh, Dr. Biden. This is something that they want to see get done, and we are going to do that. We have 
the first ever office uh, to prevent gun violence. Uh, that is something that the president created. Obviously, the vice president leads that office. And we are going to continue to find ways to protect our kids, to protect communities. And so, yes, this is an important, important, continued part of the president's initiative uh, for the next couple of months to do just that. And it is, it is Congress. We have laid out, we have laid out what it is that we believe needs to get done. They need to act. Do you have any, um, can you lay out any plans for the president? It's gonna be his <clears throat> final September 11th in office and that's always been a big deal to whoever the office mm -hmm. holder is. How, how is he going to spend September 11th uh, this year? I believe we put out, uh, uh, we put out a statement saying or, or, or confirmed that the president and the vice president are going to be uh, in New York uh, on 9-11. And so I, we'll have more to share, obviously, as we get closer to that. Um, but at, look, I have, I, I, I have traveled with the president on, um, on his trips uh, as it relates to uh, that horrific day. Uh, and he is someone who uh, certainly never forgets and always honors those that we lost uh, and will continue to do so. And, and next week he'll do that alongside the vice president. We'll leave this the other two uh, I, I don't have anything more to share beyond that, but uh, you will see the president and the vice president uh, next week uh, together as they uh, mourn uh, the thousands of lives uh, that were lost on that day and um, also the first respondents who put their obviously put their their lives on the line uh, to protect Americans on that day. Just one last small one uh, from his and his family's vacation uh, last month um, to San Inez. Um, uh, has he um, reimbursed Joe Chiani for so the I, ranch? And so can you tell us how much? Yeah, so asked? what I can say, look, I, I, I'm not going to uh, get into to cost here. Uh, First of all, the president is the president wherever he goes. Uh, he certainly was busy uh, during that, that time that he spent with his family. Uh, and so the president does what he's done uh, every, every year since he's been president, has taken that time with his family uh, around the summer months or even uh, around the holidays, uh, which, is, which is in line with other presidents. Uh, so there is the same actions, the same thing that other presidents have done when it comes to these types of vacations. I can say that this president has done. It, it is um, uh, uh, in line with the th ethics uh, that is tied into all of this. I don't have numbers here. Is that something that I can provide? Did he pay something? I, I just don't have anything beyond that to say, but to say that he's taken every uh, he's he's taken every action or done the same process that every other president has done when they have taken time with their family. There's nothing new. Uh, it is in line uh, with is what is required by him uh, to take. I don't have numbers here to share with you. Okay, Peter. Thank you. President Biden's approval rating is soaring. It's up 13 percent all the way to 48 percent. Does it bother the president that people are so pleased that he is retiring? Am I hearing a little twang in your voice, Peter? <laughs> a little something in your... I know better. <laughs> I know better. Uh, no, but, I, you know, um, you guys uh, yes, keep telling us to to appreciate him on the way out about the Inflation I, Reduction I, I Act and I'm, things I'm like that. I'm glad that you listen to me when I'm up here. Uh, look, here's what I, here's what I can say. Um, I think what the what the American people appreciate is indeed what we have been able to do uh, in the past several years. When you think about inflation is falling uh, with income while incomes are climbing, right? You think about Medicare is finally being able to negotiate lower drug costs. This president, this administration has been able to beat big farmers. That's a big deal. Other presidents have tried to do it. Other elected officials have tried to do it. They can't get it done. Manufacturing is indeed coming back here to America. Our infrastructure is being rebuilt. Violent crimes is at a low, 50-year low. Matter of fact, the last president in his last year, murder was murder rates were skyrocketing. And so the president has been able to work on that. And this is a president, a vice president, that has done the work to make Americans' lives better to make their lives better, to change their lives in a, in a transformational way uh, that is going to matter. And I think that's what the American people want to see, and that's what this president has been able to do. A different topic. Vice President Harris once said years ago that she wanted to decriminalize illegal border crossing. Now she's saying that her values haven't changed. And so how much ownership 
does she have for this latest NYPD stat that 75% of arrests in Midtown Manhattan lately have been migrants? My goodness, there was a lot in that question. Uh, and um, I mean, look, just going back to the values and obviously the vice president can speak for herself and her campaign will speak for herself, for, for her. Uh, her values haven't changed, and you heard that on the, the interview that she did with CNN very recently, and I think that's important. I think someone's values matter, and that's what you see from the vice president, and certainly that's what you see from this president. Look, as you're talking about the New York, uh, I believe it's the New York Post report, as you just stated, um, look, you heard directly from the New York Police Department. They put out a statement which was reflected in that story, so I just want to, in your story, so which want to be really clear, so I would refer you to the spokespeople uh, who spoke to this and I would say more broadly we fundamentally believe this administration including Harris because this is the Biden Harris administration believe that anyone found guilty of crimes should be held accountable that is something that we fundamentally believe and uh, you have heard us say that um, you know we welcome law uh, local law enforcement support and cooperation in apprehending and removing individuals who pose that risk who pose a national security risk and so that's what we welcome I would I would refer you to the New York Police Department they actually spoke to this uh, and kind of you know kind of spoke to uh, that number that was being used and I would refer you to them and so my last question then would be, if the vice president's values have not changed, why have so many of her positions on policies changed? I would say look at what the vice president has done with this president the last three and a half years. Look what we have been able to do. Look what we've been able to do at the border without much help from Republicans because they're too busy listening to the former president, sadly, and telling them not to actually do the things that majority of Americans want to see them doing, and that being dealing with uh, the challenges at the border. They listen to Donald Trump instead of continuing to work with us in a bipartisan way. That's what they chose to do. That's on them. But because of the actions that this administration has taken, we have seen. We have seen uh, those actions uh, lead to numbers going down at the border, and that matters, and that matters, and that's because of the work that we have done. And um, you know, and you heard me talk about the economy, uh, what the president and this vice president have been able to do. We cannot forget what the Biden-Harris administration inherited when they walked into this administration. A once in a century pandemic, people were dying. Thousands of people were dying a day. And the last administration, the Trump administration, didn't bother to leave a comprehensive plan on dealing with the pandemic. They didn't bother. They were too busy. He was too busy telling people to inject uh, bleach into their bodies. That's what he was doing. Meanwhile, this president and this vice president passed the American Rescue Plan. Only Democrats voted for that. And because of that, we were able to open up schools. Because of that, we were able to open up businesses. Because of that, we were able to put some checks in pockets for people who really needed it, who really needed it. Think about the child tax credit. That changed lives for, for families and put uh, shots in arms. And so that is why we have an economy that is growing that is why we have an economy that is leading the world. And those are just the facts. Cancel. Uh, you said for uh, September 11th <clears throat> that the president and the vice president will be in New York. Yeah. Did you say if they'll be at Ground Zero I, Memorial? I, uh, they will be at Ground Zero. I, I don't, I we'll have more details to share. Okay. They'll be at Ground Zero for the memorial? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, on, on guns as well, um, does the president feel that he's exhausted executive actions at this point? On I mean, report? look, Zolan, you know this, you've covered this. The president has taken more than two dozen executive actions, two dozen executive actions on, on trying to do everything that he can to prevent gun violence. That is a lot. Uh, look, he will always find ways uh, to see what else he can do to see what else his administration, the actions his administration can take. We have the Office of uh, the Gun Violence Prevention, and what that does, one of the things that does is those executive actions and also that uh, legislation that was passed and that he signed uh, to make sure that we move quickly uh, with those actions and, and uh, particular components of that act, uh, and so that we put that out there into uh, 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 into communities and make sure that we're doing everything we can to continue to keep or to try to keep communities safe. But the answer is legislation. We have to have laws, more laws, additional laws, uh, so that we can 
protect communities. But as far as the White House, I mean, do you feel that is the White House fully in implementation phase with, with the actions already taken, or are there any executive actions that could... As I said taken? in my answer just seconds ago, we are going to do everything that we can, his agencies out there, inclu including with the, uh, the president, uh, to see what else we can be, what else can be done. But more than two dozen executive actions is nothing to sleep on, right? That is something that he took, he, he moved forward on because Congress wasn't moving fast enough. Right? We were able to get that bipartisan uh, act done, but we needed to do more. Uh, and so, look, we'll always find ways uh, to move, uh, to, to see what else can be done, but we have to get Congress uh, to do the work. We know congressional dem Democrats are ready to do the work. We need congressional Republicans to join uh, those Democrats. Uh, look, but signing the law, uh, the bipartisan uh, Safer Communities Act, uh, was not a, a small feat. Well, lastly, that was a big thing to, to get done. In terms of congressional help, has yes. he, uh, does he have any meetings scheduled at the White House? Or, uh, yeah, does he have any meetings yeah. scheduled with yeah. members of Congress to actually talk about a way forward? So I don't have any meetings to read out to you that that relates to this particular issue. I've said, I say this all the time. We have the Office of Ledge Affairs. Uh, they talk to uh, congressional members uh, pretty regularly on an array of issues. Uh, that's important to uh, the president, to the American people. Certainly that will continue. Uh, you know, but it, it doesn't stop us continuing to uh, to to say how sad this day is, to, to really be clear that this should not be happening, and enough is enough, and we need to, uh, to continue to do the work, and that really is on the other side of Pennsylvania. Congress has to continue to do the work uh, to stop this, and that means we need laws. We need laws. Okay, Jeff. Thank you. Um, Kirby mentioned that the, uh, regarding U.S. Steel, that mm -hmm. the, the president's position on that, and that it was appropriate to have a CPS review. Can you give us an update on where the CFIUS review stands and when you expect to hear from them? So I don't have any news to make uh, today on any, uh, any, anything like that. The CFIUS review, as you know, is incredibly independent. Uh, the CFIUS is, uh, hasn't transmitted a recommendation yet uh, to the president, and that's the next step in, in this process. Uh, but I don't have anything else to add uh, beyond that. Uh, look, you heard from the president and the vice president on Labor Day. They were very clear. Uh, they are committed to uh, ensuring steel is made in America. That's what the president said. And, and, uh, and making sure that uh, unionized workers uh, uh, and U.S. Steel should, should remain in American company. That's what he wants to see. Uh, as far as the CFIUS review, they're going through their process. They'll make a recommendation. We just don't have anything to share on that today. Okay. Thank you, Kareem. Uh, the president's son, Hunter, is set to begin a trial for tax issues later this week. I was wondering if the president plans to attend any part of the trial? So what I'll say from the top, uh, and you have heard me say this many times, is that uh, 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 Hunter is a private citizen, as you all know. Uh, so when it comes to any his own legal uh, circumstances, I would certainly re refer you to him on his uh, personal representatives. I would say as well that, uh, of course, the president and the first lady, uh, they love their son. They're proud of their of his resilience and his strength, and they are support him as he continues to move forward uh, in his um, uh, in his life. Uh, I don't have anything else to add beyond that, uh, and I will just leave it there for now. Has the president advised Hunter in any way on how to approach He's a private citizen. He has his own legal representation, uh, and I won't share beyond that. I won't give it beyond that. Okay. The president's uh, statement about the shooting talks about how it's personal to him. You've mentioned that a yeah. few times. Can you just speak at all to how he reacted to the news when he heard today? It's it's that devastating. we are back here again. It's, we are back here again. You're right. It's devastating. It's devastating. It is, uh, I, I, you heard me say this, and I think it's in the president's statement as well. It is in the president's statement in that first paragraph where he talks about uh, this is basically a school year, a new school year. This is supposed to be an opportunity for kids to celebrate, see their friends, be joyous, as the president says, um, and yet we see another horrific shooting. And it is, it's heartbreaking. I mean, when the president says it's personal to him, uh, you know, you hear something like that. These are children. Children. Let's follow up then on, yeah. on Dolan's questions. 
you laid out everything you want Congress to do. Yeah. That if it is so devastating to this president, what is he doing to help Americans feel better about sending their kids to school tomorrow? So, if you look at the president's actions and what he has done since almost day one of this administration, if you think about the two dozen actions that he's taken, executive actions that he's taken, that is showing Americans that this is an issue where whether it is sending your kids to school, whether it's your community that he cares about and wants communities and schools to be safe. We should be safe in our communities. And then he worked and reached across the aisle when people said he could not get it done because it's been decades, decades since we were able to get uh, something like uh, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act done. And he reached across the aisle to get that done. That, I think that shows to the American people that he took this very seriously. And lastly, he started the Office to Prevent Gun Violence that the Vice President leads. And what that does, and this is really going to get to you the heart of your question, is that uh, what they, one of the things that they do is they reach out to communities, especially in a moment like this, and figure out what can we do uh, to help a community heal and move forward. Uh, and it's, I mean, just think about it. The fact that we had to set up an office like that is just devastating to think about. But we had to. And the president wanted to continue to show to Americans how serious he was. And that's why we have an office to move forward, obviously, with the executive actions, to move forward uh, with the law, to make sure they're rapidly uh, being executed, but also to help families and communities. Uh, and look, um, there's no easy answer here because it's devastating. It is devastating. I'm a mom. You're a mom. Many of, our, of your colleagues are parents. And to see this on the week that you're sending your kids to school is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. I mean, I think about it all the time. What, hap what would happen? Um, and then you hear your kids are going through lockdowns. That's freaking, that's awful. Um, but I think what the American people could be assured of, and all they have to do is look at the president's action, is that he's going to do everything that he can. But we need, we really do need Republicans in Congress to act. We do. We do need them to act. Democrats are ready. They need to join us. Cat Ed. Yeah, thanks, I'm going to ask you about the economy. Um, so the JOLTS report came out that shows that 7.7 uh, .7 million jobs are open in this country, but the revisions in that number showed that the layoffs have been revised up last month, 62,000, 1.6 million. You know, we have a jobs report coming out on Friday. Has yeah. the jobs growth significantly stalled in this country? So a couple of things uh, that I do want to touch about, touch on, uh, and uh, look, because of the because of the strong recovery and the work that this president and this vice president has been able uh, to do over the past three and a half years, job, o job openings remain high and lay layoffs are in near record lows. I think that's important to point out. That's what we see in, the, in that JOLTS report. Uh, and you, th you talk about layoffs. Uh, in fact, they are lower than the average during the, prime, the prior administration, even before COVID, even before COVID, because I know folks want to focus on COVID, but even before then. And the ratio of job openings to unemployed workers is back to its pre-pandemic levels as well. So uh, look, we're trying to get our economy back to normal and we're seeing signs of that. We're seeing data. Uh, the job market remains strong. We have unemployment that is uh, low at 4.3%. Jobs are being created at a healthy pace with more than 170,000 jobs created per month over the last month. PCE inflation is down by 2.3%, 2.5%, pardon me. Uh, GDP grew by 3% last quarter. And all of this data is important to note. And to your question, um, you know, any, you know, specifically about layoffs, we're monitoring that. We're going to continue to monitor, monitor that. Uh, well, of course, it matters to the president uh, when Americans uh, are losing jobs and the impact that may have on them. Uh, and so that is something that the president understands and knows what it means uh, to families. A quick, quick follow-up. Then how concerned is the president on what the jobs number will show on Friday? Look, I'm not going to get in ahead of that. I'm not going to predict, and you know that. We say this all the time. I'm not going to stand, stand here and predict job numbers. Uh, what I could say is this is a president and a vice president that has put the economy uh, as a priority. 
Uh, and we know that Americans obviously want jobs. They want good paying jobs. That is something that we have focused on. And also they want us to see a lower, lower cost. And that's something that, that you see from this administration. When we talk about the economy, we talk about our policies. And also when we talk about our policies more broadly, having equity at the center of it, because we want to make sure that uh, communities who have felt that they've been left behind are not. Guy Garen. Uh, the NAACP and others are condemning a, an upcoming comedy roast of Vice President Harris on the campus of University of South Carolina, uh, which is also featuring two right-wing extremist leaders that includes the co-founder of the Proud Boys. The advertisement <coughs> for the event makes very vulgar and sexual references to the Vice President, uh, which the, the, the organizations are calling obscene and potentially a violation of the school's policy on discrimination. Um, they're also calling for this to be canceled. Does the White House join uh, groups uh, condemning this and calling for this to be canceled, or does the White House believe that this is protected free speech? So, look, I'm not familiar. We're, I'm not familiar with this particular event, so I want to be super mindful. But I hear what you're saying, uh, and here's what I will say. And you heard the president say this um, many times, especially in the past uh, several weeks. Um, or you, at least you've heard me say this echoing what the president has said, is that picking the vice president was the, was the best decision that he's ever made. Uh, and he's proud to have worked with her, uh, to have her as a critical partner in the past three and a half years. And uh, it, whether it's making the largest investment in public safety, uh, beating back big pharma, uh, you've heard me go back and forth with Ed on the economy and what we believe we've been able to do and what, how we've been able to deliver for the American people. You've heard me talk to uh, Peter about this as well, as what we think the American people want to see. But he has been able to do this with her in partnership. And so he's proud of her. Uh, he's proud that he, was, uh, that he selected her. And I think that is, and he is proud to continue to serve alongside with the vice president. And so I'll leave it there. I'm not going to dive into the event. I don't know much about it. Uh, but, uh, and I would say that I, I would speak for my colleagues here. I think we are very much all proud uh, to have uh, the vice president uh, as our vice president. And the work that we have seen her do with this president for the past three and a half years. Uh, and I'll leave it there. I don't want to comment on it directly, but do, what does the White House uh, think of when there are these sort of r racist and sexist references to the vice president? Look, this is an administration, this is a president, when he decided what this administration would look like, he decided to have an administration that looked like the rest of the country. He wanted it to make sure that it was diverse, uh, and because it was important to him, to have certain communities who have felt like they've been left behind to have a seat at the table. That's what this president has been able to do. And you see that. This is the most diverse administration in modern political history. I think that says everything that you need to know about what this president cares about. Uh, and that starts with the vice president, his decision to pick her as his running mate. Uh, and he was very purposeful, mindful. She was uh, obviously experienced, and he knew she could do the job uh, and wanted to make sure that we had a diverse administration to go alongside that. And, you know, I, it is, uh, I think that is the most important thing that matters. I can't speak to everybody else. I can't speak to every racist, misogynistic, sexist comment that's made out there. What I can speak to is what the reflection of this administration and what we have been able to do and how we have represented uh, in a way I think that many Americans should be proud of, I certainly am, uh, and to make sure that people feel represented, not just in how we look, but in the policies that we have put forward. And I think that's what matters. Oh, uh, sure. <coughs> sorry. Uh, what does the White House make of recent elite colleges like MIT, Amherst, and Tufts reporting sharp declines in black and Latino enrollment and increases in white enrollment since the affirmative action ruling from the Supreme Court? Uh, the president and the Department of Education released guidance and resources to campuses to uh, continue diversity on college campuses. Obviously, the data suggested that that. Uh, isn't necessarily working. Yeah. Does the White House believe there is more it can do to prevent this 
trend from happening in other college campuses? So uh, a couple of things, and this is really an, an, uh, very important because we call that out, that this could potentially happen when the Supreme Court made that decision. Uh, their decision moved the nation backwards as you're laying out and uh, in what we're seeing right now, an unpended decades of precedent uh, that allowed America's colleges and university to build vibrant, uh, diverse environments. I just talked about the importance of this administration and being diverse and representing uh, majority of this country and what this country looks like. So the president called on college and universities to seize the opportunity to expand access uh, to educational opportunity. And this administration has issued guidance, as you just stated, on specific actions universities uh, can take to provide opportunity to all Americans. We know, like we understand and we know that the talent exists in all communities. Uh, it's clear more work remains uh, to be done and we'll continue calling on schools to build pathways uh, for upward and upward mobility and success and that is what I know the Department of Education is focused on and I know that they uh, this is something that is incredibly important and so we have made uh, put putting that aside we've made historic uh, historic investments in HBCUs um, and uh, and we have that is also why the president has made a student debt relief a priority uh, and uh, and so we'll continue to do everything that we can uh, to ensure that Americans have have access uh, to educational opportunities that is our commitment that is the president's commitment and you have seen that along the way over the past three and a half years okay we should. So four years ago you were serving as chief of staff to then candidate Harris mm -hmm. for vice president is there anything you can share about how she prepares for a debate? <laughs> oh, that is so oh, very interesting. Very clever, Weisha. Yeah. Well, you would know. Uh, you're right. I would know. Um, look, I, um, I, I do want to be... What you just stated is correct. Um, uh, that was my role four years ago. Um, I was the chief of staff to the running mate, uh, obviously, who's now the vice president. Um, and involved in, in the debate at that time. Uh, I do want to be mindful because obviously in a week, uh, in less than a week, there'll be a debate uh, that uh, the vice president will be participating in. And I would have her campaign speak to that specifically, uh, however they wish uh, to talk about that. Uh, what I can say more broadly speaking is, um, and I think you've all seen that, especially uh, very recently, uh, you know, the vice president is, uh, is smart. Uh, she is uh, someone uh, that knows how to get the job done. Uh, and, um, uh, and as the president has said, and I will echo this, I mean, I, I, you know, we all certainly uh, believe as well when the president said that it was the best decision that he's made um, as picking her as, as his uh, running mate. And so I think it's a stay tuned kind of moment, and I'll let the campaign speak to it. Has the president offered any advice to her since he was just in the shoes she will be in in, in a few days? So, look, what I'll say is that the president and the vice president speak regularly. They see each other regularly. You saw them, obviously, on Monday uh, together, shoulder to shoulder. Uh, talking about how they've been able to deliver for the American people, talking about Labor Day, the importance of, of union, the president uh, being named uh, the most pro-union uh, president uh, ever, uh, which is a, a title that he's very proud of. Uh, I don't have anything beyond that. They speak regularly. Um, he certainly is proud of everything that she's been able to accomplish, especially as we look at the past uh, couple of weeks. I just don't have anything beyond that. Thank you. Go ahead, Mike. I know you're not in here regularly. Okay. I'm always here in spirit, though. In spirit. You know I, feel um, it. I feel it all the time, every day. I know that um, we're still early hours of this tragedy, but I just wanted to ask yeah. if there are were any early indications you received about yeah, there potential changes or additions to the president's schedule. Obviously, he's supposed to be on the road the next two days. Look, I, you know, as you just stated, stated in your question to me, uh, these are certainly uh, the very early uh, early moments, early hours of this. So I don't certainly don't have anything on about the present schedule uh, to share of any changes. Uh, but you know, as the president says in his statement, uh, he and Dr. Biden are mourning, uh, mourning uh, the deaths of those who whose lives were cut short due to senseless violence. And I think uh, it's a sad day. It's a sad day. And I cannot imagine. Uh, I know uh, the parents uh, who have. Uh, their child going to that school are probably frightened, uh, scared, 
mourning and our hearts go out to them. And I, and, you know, and I know that just parents across the country are thinking about this day and, and this is a day that you fear, a day that you fear. Uh, and I think this goes a little bit into the question that I got uh, from Mary Alice. It's like, yeah, now parents have to think about tomorrow and the next day and the school year. And um, what I want them to know is that the president is doing and the vice president of this administration is doing everything that we can uh, to make sure that communities feel safe. And that means also calling out on Congress, Republicans in Congress to act, uh, to do more, to meet Democrats and to do the work. There's more, there's more that we can do uh, to make sure that parents and kids and, and teachers uh, feel safe when they wake up tomorrow morning and have to go uh, back to school. And it is a sad day. It is a sad day. And then with regard to the president's travel the next two days, obviously yeah. these are different kinds of events that he might have been doing if he was still a candidate for re-election. Can you talk about how the White House has sort of reimagined what he will be doing, how he will be traveling these next few months? Uh, look, I, you heard us, uh, as you said, he's traveling the next couple of days. He's going to be going to Wisconsin tomorrow. He's going to uh, Michigan on Friday. Uh, and uh, he was just in um, Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh with the vice president um, on, on Monday. And so what I'll say is he'll be out there. He'll be out there talking directly to the American people. He looks forward to it. It's something that he has done, not just looking at the next several months, but he's done this the last three and a half years. And he believes it's important to do that, to let Americans know what is it that we've been doing, what, how we've been delivering for them, whether it's healthcare, economy, um, and, um, and have we been able to grow the economy uh, back. And so this is something that, the, that, as it relates to travel, you'll see the president is certainly out there, and we'll have more to share. We'll have more to share. But he's, he's ready to be out there uh, and uh, ready to talk directly to the American people. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Thanks, Karine. Thank